right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Laura Lenderman from the 502nd Air Base Wing, Joint Base San Antonio. And I'm just grateful that everyone that uh, got the word is here. And if, you, uh, if your friends and family members that couldn't be here or want to hear, we are taping this uh, town hall. So that said, if you do not want to be videotaped or you don't want to be recorded, um, we can definitely redact your, your name and, and your, what you say or how you say it. Um, just let us know. Uh, we have our PA team in the back, and, and they will do some editing afterwards and make sure that you and your, your uh, comments are not included, if that's your desire. Um, but we are, again, we're grateful that you're here. This is our second town hall at Randolph. Um, it is part of the Military Family Housing Review. Um, I want to say on a personal note, I'm grateful to see a lot of the families that we've gotten a chance to meet with um, and, and spend some time with you in your homes and visiting with your children and yourselves. Um, we look forward to hearing what, what's on your mind. We do have some things that we want to share with you in terms of what the government has been able to do over the last couple of weeks. And then uh, we have a great panel here of uh, government and also our hunt team, and they want to share what they've been able to do over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but with that, I want to introduce to my right is our civil engineering director, Richard Trevino. Um, he is the person that's responsible for the military family housing home on the government side. So Diane Butler, if you receive her emails, um, she works for Richard and Richard works for me. Uh, and so just again to make sure we understand the relationships, um, there is a government uh, side of the house and then our job is to provide oversight of the Hunt project. And then on top of that, there is an Air Force Civil Engineering Center, and that's Colonel Beach to my left here. So he's from a layer above us, and he works over at Lackland. And so he owns the portfolio for the entire Air Force. So he can speak to just about any housing project, um, but specifically, we're interested in Randolph tonight. And then to his left is Lieutenant Colonel Skinner from the 59th Medical Wing. So he can speak to any medical concerns um, when it comes to the testing that we've done so far, the blood testing, um, future, any future testing that you're interested in. And then he brought along an allergist. So Lieutenant Colonel Adams is here that can speak to the specifics of mold and those kinds of things and the effects on the individuals. We have also uh, one of our JAG representatives, Lieutenant Colonel Martin. He's, one, he's our team here at Randolph. So a lot of you have sought legal assistance, and we're extremely grateful that you're taking uh, that advantage of that service. And it is open to everybody. It's free of charge. Um, they are trained and certified lawyers. They've passed the bar. So every, every legal question that you have, <laughs> right? No, just kidding. <laughs> no, they are, they are excellent, and they are advocates on your behalf. So again, if you're not familiar with uh, that service, they're here in this building. So they're in, and Colonel Martin's here, and he can connect you with a lawyer after the, the meeting tonight. Then we have Colonel Jeff Carter. You may have gotten some emails from him or seen him around your neighborhood. He lives right in this neighborhood, right across the street from the PAR Club. He's my executive agent and the security forces group commander for the 502nd, and he's a, a, a huge advocate for you and your families as well. We also have Colonel Mark Robinson from the 12th Line Training Wing, our, our major mission partner here at Randolph, and he's here in support. He also has families living in base housing, and he himself lives in base housing. So um, he's here as well to advocate on your behalf. And with that, I'll turn it over to Audra to introduce her team uh, from our Hunt Housing Partners. And before I, I leave the government first, though, over here we have um, many more members of our environmental team and our housing team. Um, we've got Ed, we've got Diane, James, um, a whole bunch of other folks from, from the government side of the house that are here and willing to help. Chief Master Sergeant Lantain, he's our command chief as well. So he's connected with all of your first sergeants. And again, this, these are all resources for you when you're having challenges with your family home, and we want to be able to help you. So same, uh, same kind of situation as last time. We want you to be honest and forthcoming. Uh, we want to hear what's on your mind, hear your concerns. Um, we do, uh, we're going to go over some other pieces and parts when we get to the open forum, but I did want to lay the ground rules that this is an opportunity for you to, and for us to listen. So with that, I'll turn it over to Audra. Good, e good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to thank you for coming tonight. Um, 
We're just going to run through quick um, introductions. My name is Audra Froome. I am the community director here at Randolph Air Force Base. Um, I have Michael Knight. He is our regional maintenance director over, over AETC2, BLB, and um, a few others. And then we have Angela Unterbrink, which is the director of operations, um, and she is over AETC2. We also um, have Nicholas Miglieri. He is um, in the crowd here. He is our environmental director. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard, who's going to talk about some of the things that the uh, Civil Engineering Group and our wing has been able to accomplish. Thank you, ma'am. Again, good evening, folks. Thank you for coming uh, this evening. Thank you for taking the time to share this moment with us. So what we wanted to do was give you an update from the last town hall, the things that within uh, the 502 that we were able to do. First and foremost, if you remember, we did send out surveys to each and every resident, and you should have received those surveys really in, one, in basically one or two manners. You should have got it as an email blast. You should also have gotten it as a hard copy. If you had not gotten those surveys, or if you're unclear on what those surveys were about, please by all means let us know, and we'll make sure that you get to, we'll, we'll give you a copy of the survey to complete. But what we did do is we sent out the 317 surveys, and we got a good return back in terms of 93, a part of that initial distribution. In addition to that, so for the, po for the folks that did not return our survey, we went out also and contacted you via telephone to see if you wanted to also provide information as part of, in, in response to that survey from that perspective. So when we did the, the telephone calls, we received another 63 surveys as a result of our telephone contact. So we appreciate you all doing that because what that allowed us to do is gather that information and allowed us to really address your concerns so that we in turn can work within the Air Force as well as work with Hunt to try to address those. As a result, as a result of those surveys, we also conducted 35 health and wellness visits. Those health and wellness visits included folks within the 502nd leadership. In some cases it was General Linderman, in some cases it was Colonel Carter or any one of her staff came out to your house and we in turn, you were gracious enough to let us in and we were to at least listen to your concerns and figure out how can we get them resolved. The main thing out of the wellness visits, what we wanted to try to impress upon folks, and this is exactly what General Linderman has indicated, there was still some confusion on whether or not did Diane Butler and my staff work for Hunt or did they actually work for General Linderman and myself. So we do have, you do have advocacy through the Air Force through the 502nd. So when you talk to Diane and the entire staff out there, we are your advocate. If you don't know where to go or not what to do or otherwise, you can definitely contact us. And as part of this presentation, we'll give you a long list of contacts that if you can't get a hold of Diane or otherwise or my staff, you can even contact me if necessary. And also, what we want to also take a look at is you also have an opportunity that if you need to get resolution, if you want to go to your chain of command, that's also another option that you can take a look at. If you want to contact your first sergeant and so forth, we'll gladly sit down with everybody and try to get issues resolved. As a result of the surveys, what we also started doing is actually taking by address the concerns that the residents had, documenting those concerns, and then we do sit down pretty much daily with Hunt to come to a way of how we can resolve those concerns. So we do take a look at that and we try to track it and if things are not being done, then we will work with Hunt to try to figure out why is it not getting taken care of. One of the things that was also brought up during the town hall, one of the concerns was, well, these are historical houses and we can't do anything about it. So that's not a true statement as I indicated during the last town hall. So our cultural resources manager sat down with the Texas State Historic Preservation Office and we have laid out and we've worked with, with uh, different uh, housing providers across Joint Base San Antonio and have sat down to say, these are the things that you can do. When it comes to maintenance, when it comes to repairs or otherwise, there is a lot more flexibility with the historical units than we really believe that there are. So when people say, well, I can't touch it because it's historical, we have to be careful when we say that because in some cases that's not necessarily true. We can touch it, we just have to basically do it in a certain way. So part of it was an education piece to understand what can we really do to a historical unit. So there are things, there are a lot of things that we can do. So our responsibility was to work with 
Hunt and, and the rest of the housing providers to where they fully understood those flexibilities. And that was incumbent upon us to make sure that that got done. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, so for the residents' concerns, as a result of the surveys, of those 150 plus surveys that were done, these are the basic major issues that were identified from the residents. Most of these you've already seen. They were addressed as part of, uh, they were highlighted as part of the previous town hall, and they were all pretty consistent in terms of, you know, what's the sustainment plan? How's this not, you know, being ready for turnover? And looking at the work order process, concerns as it pertains to how do we address mold? How do we address, you know, pest management issues, HVAC, duct cleaning, and so forth? These were the concerns that were presented to us as a result of the surveys. And then that allowed us to really set at least the baseline to figure out where do we start addressing the issues. Because what we don't want to do is address something that's really not your primary concern because we're not really hitting the mark then. Okay? So one last thing that we said, General Lemon just briefly talked about was, the le so the legal assistance, we had the legal workshops. Again, this was another avenue as military families where we have the opportunity to assist you to look at those things that you can look at the lease agreements, you can look at what's your, what are your rights, what's the understanding, understanding what a lease document is. Some of the feedback that we received from some of the residents was, well, yes, I signed it, but I didn't really know what it meant or what this particular issue meant. So by working with Colonel Martin and his staff, you now have the ability to talk to individuals that can give you that insight in terms of what does it really mean? What are your rights and so forth? So with that, I'll turn it over to Colonel Skinner. Good evening. So just a couple things uh, real quickly. Uh, those that took advantage of the opportunity to get blood lead level testing, if that was a concern of yours, the great news is that that really has produced no results that are of medical concern, so that's a good health outcome, good knowledge information. Uh, the water system is routinely monitored, and all of those routine monitorings do show that the water is meeting all safe drinking water standards, both federal and state. And then uh, you'll hear me say it a, a bunch of times if we go forward, is that your primary care manager is your point of interest and is your point of entry for health and well-being for you. We are here to serve you and to make sure that uh, you get the health care that you need. So if there's concerns about your health for any reason, doesn't need to be a housing issue, but if there's health care concerns in any reason, please, please come see us. Thanks. All right, so Colonel Mike Beach, I'm the, uh, from the Air Force Civil Engineer Center, and as uh, General Lindemann briefed, I'm the portfolio manager for the, all of the Air Force housing portfolio. So I have privatized housing, government housing that we still own, which is in the, primarily in the overseas fleets, and then dormitories. So, you know, this whole effort kicked off, right? So what has is, what is Big Air Force been doing, right? So as you guys know, right, we started off with uh, the chief and the secretary directed a 100% uh, survey of all of our active duty members that are living in housing. Also, they went out to the, I'm sorry, stay on the, go back to that slide. The, uh, they went out to pretty much the, the, the bases that presented with the worst symptoms, right? The, uh, and so the chief and the secretary personally, and Mr. Henderson, our political appointee that has this, this uh, portfolio in his, uh, his AO, you know, went out to the to McDill, Tinker, and Keesler. Those are kind of the, the the biggest ones that made the news. Personally, you know, did some sensing sessions with Airmen and their families, and uh, also the the professional staffers have been out, and uh, and and the congressional members from the the two armed service committees in the the House and the Senate, and also we've been receiving uh, OSD and Air Force IG complaints from members. And finally, that IG investigation. So at the beginning of this, the, the other flavor of the IG investigation was, you know, how do things go this poorly for us? So th that IG investigation is largely uh, of my office and, and those above me as to how we administer this portfolio. And uh, that report has not yet been published. The, uh, so there, on the next slide there. So. 
did all, you know, did a lot of sensing, got a lot of data, as uh, Mr. Trevino mentioned, a lot of data for Randolph. So that's all going on across the whole Air Force. And we've kind of crystallized the plan into some lines of effort to get to get the housing back where it's supposed to be, right, back where, we're, back where we want it to be. So they're starting off at the beginning with the empowering residents. A consistent theme from uh, from uh, the sensing was that residents did not feel empowered. You know, they, you all felt like you were kind of trapped in a in a landlord tenant arrangement and you were uh, unable to access the normal remedies that are available to people on the outside. So we wanted to get a bill of rights out there so that everybody knows at the beginning what's you know what's up, so to speak. So that that is actually the the draft has been circulated among the three service secretaries. It's over on the Hill getting uh, input from Congress. I was on a conference call this morning with some, you know, SES attorneys. So they're, that process is still ongoing. The, uh, also we're looking at establishing some resident councils where we can have, kind of like if you've, if you've been overseas, right, where you have, uh, you know, there's a panel of people who actually live in housing that can speak directly to the commander about whatever concerns they're having. And, and those are very productive for us, so we're going to implement that in the privatized fleet. The uh, work order, vis order visibility, it seems like a, a recurring theme is repeat work orders, work not done very well or quality is low. So we want to get to a point where we have, it, it's very clear from uh, the member's point of view, like uh, it's not just calling up a number, did they enter into the system? I don't know, right? It's a, uh, the example that Mr. Henderson uses, he's a renter in DC, right? He has an app, you know, the, the main bath on the first floor has a leaky toilet, right? And he can punch that into the app, gets a number right there, and then just like your Amazon package coming, you know, the plumber is in the shop getting materials. He's on his way to your house, right? Like there's a ongoing effort, and then after it's over, you get a survey. Did they fix the problem right the first time? Yes, no, right? You can answer the survey. And that is a, so that's all automated, right? So we're, it's, uh, it takes out the human element, so you don't have this. I call them in, you look in the system, I don't have a record. Well, that's because they didn't type it in, right? So we, we want get, to get out of that business and get straight to getting the work done. Uh, tenant advocates and legal assistance, those are kind of intertwined. So we're, uh, we've submitted a $30 million unfunded for FY20 for personnel to plus up the government housing offices around the Air Force. One of those roles will be a tenant advocate. And we want to model it after, if you've ever been to the clinic, to the, the patient advocate, right? This is a person that isn't in the housing enterprise, isn't uh, uh, beholden to either the owner or the housing staff, right? They're on the outside, and their job mainly is to connect residents with resources and kind of break down barriers for getting after issues that are uh, persisting for one reason or another. And that, and that kind of ties into the legal assistance piece, right? So the over time, we kind of stopped leaning on the judge advocates for legal assistance for privatized housing. You know, if you were in, in an off-base na neighborhood and you got, you know, you could take your lease to your judge advocate and they would give you legal assistance if you're having a problem, right, and they would advise you of your rights. And, and we kind of stopped advertising that that was a, a thing with the judge advocates, so we're reinvigorating that program. And then uh, we, you can see the 1-800 helpline. So if anybody has any issues and you're not getting satisfaction, you can call that number and a person in my office will answer and take down your info and we'll, and we'll take that for action, right? We've gotten, the, the number has been up and running for probably about a month now. We're getting several calls a week. You know, the first week we got 10 calls and you know, the two, two of them were the chief of staff of the Air Force. You know, three of them were commanders calling to see if the number worked, but the rest of them were calls from residents, right? So uh, people are like, I don't believe that's working, Beach. Oh no, sir, call, right? And they called, hey, and she picked up, yay, right? So, uh, so definitely call and we'll, you know, the point there is to put the resources on the problem, right? If we are, if you're getting stymied for some reason, uh, we know the people to call to get the resources on it. And, and it's no matter who it is. And on the bottom there, engage leadership. So our oversight structure really, uh, we're reinvigorating and uh, addressing some, some new, initiatives with uh, squad commanders, first sergeants, chiefs, group commanders, wing commanders, right, to, to really drive back into the enterprise, commander influence, and uh, ownership of, of local issues. So 
you know, quarterly commander evaluations, you know, in writing. Uh, we want to standardize the dispute resolution process uh, across the portfolio. The way it is now, this is, this is somewhat tough to do, you got, please bear with me. You know, landlord-tenant law is a state-based law thing, right? So depending on which state you're in, there's variations in your rights and the landlord's rights. But we want to have, so when you move from place to place, it may not be exactly the same, but my goal is to have it be where if you are in an MHPI or a housing privatization project in California and you move to Texas or you move to North Carolina, that you're going to recognize, oh yeah, this is, a, this is the kind of lease that I'm used to seeing. And I, if I have a problem, this is the dispute resolution process that I use so that you, you're not having to relearn a process in every, every PCS. And then the, the bottom bullet there, the manager review committee structure is kind of the, the, that's a regular meeting that we have that kind of talks about how the business is going, right? We talk about financials and how we're going to be able to keep the homes nice in the future. But we, we probably struck a balance to, you know, the, these projects are resource limited, right? So we've been very focused in the past on ensuring that the homes are going to be nice in 20 years for the airmen that are not born yet. A legit criticism of my office would be, well, you know, you, you kind of you kind of sacrificed us today, boss. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, I'm, we're we're going to move that move the needle to the left, right, and get and uh, make sure we we refocus on current ops to uh, ensure that we don't we aren't saving for tomorrow when we have a lot of legit work to get after today. Mm -hmm. And then on the uh, improved oversight, there's. The top block there is really more uh, that, that's centric on what my office does in terms of going to the various projects, ensuring the portfolio operates like it's supposed to, and uh, and like that middle one there, adjust product op project operating budgets. So we're going to have to you know make, ensure those maintenance accounts are are where they need to be, ensure that the the uh, maintenance staffs are fully staffed, the leasing staffs are are good to go. Our communication and feedback processes. I talked about the work order visibility, but we also want to relook at our satisfaction surveys and how we get feedback from you all. So, you know, I can't overemphasize how important the surveys are today, because we really make a lot of decisions based on the data that we get out of those. But at the same time, we want to revamp that process to uh, focus it in more to make it more responsive to uh, to the problems that have emerged most recently. And then on the policy legislation slide, I talked a little bit about common leases already. Uh, we're, we're working with the medical community on mm -hmm. um, mold and moisture policy and, and kind of clearing up the, uh, the gray areas that we run into when you get into a privatized environment where it's not necessarily a government facility, or, but it's still on the base. And you know, it's not an off-base facility where it's totally commercial either. And then the bottom one there, so the you know, these projects, they all, they all operate on the rent that we all pay, right? So the, and at the end of the month, there's money left over, goes into an account that, that uh, we draw money out of the account to make improvements later, right? To buy new roofs, all the fridges that we bought 10 years ago, we need to buy new fridges, like that's where that money comes from. And the way some of these projects are set up right now, that money, when it comes out, gets taxed, like income, because this is a private entity. So that, that's a significant bill, 30 to 40 percent. So we want to, engage with Congress and try to get some tax relief there so the money that is in the project stays in the project. So I think that that is my last one. Thank you. All right, and now we'd like to turn it over to Hunt and they're going to describe some of the initiatives that they've been pursuing over the last several weeks. Good evening all. Thanks for stopping by um, spending time with us. I know it's dinner time so um, Audra did a really great job of, of briefly introducing our team. Um, this slide kind of goes over um, some of our credentials, some of the experience levels that each member of our team has, um, as well as any, any military affiliations that we have. Um, since this is going to be recorded, I obviously am not going to bore you with reading this line by line or verbatim. Um, so this next slide, um, during the last town hall, we had some pretty direct questions about where are you spending our money? So what I wanted to do with this slide is show that AETC2 is comprised of six properties. All of those properties share budget and share resources. So sometimes the resources and budget sharing is, is a bonus, right? If, if we're short-staffed, we can call on other properties, send staffing teams over. 
Um, you know, Mike is an excellent resource that we have on our team to be able to help supplement the, the maintenance needs. But the shared budget can also become a bit of a challenge. So what I want to do with this slide is kind of show the resources over the last, well, including last year, as well as moving forward for the five-year sustainment plan. So this is a percentage-based um, formula that shows what the resources for each of the six properties. And as you'll see last year, Randolph did get the biggest piece of the pie. Um, but then it does kind of move the needle a little bit over the course of the five years, depending on other needs of other properties within the portfolio. Next slide. So the legal structure, Colonel Beach spoke to this a little bit. Um, so we are, like many other housing installations, we're a partnership between the federal government and the project owner. Um, we've actually been uh, really impressed with how well we've been able to partner. Um, with the Air Force, whether it's Colonel Beach or um, our AFCAC PM or the housing office here. Um, even in the hard times, we, we've done a really good job partnering with them. So shared project funds, um, in case anyone is wondering, you know, is there somebody that watches us spend the money? Yes, there is. Um, the project funds are managed by a third party pursuant to the budget that is actually approved by the Air Force. So they kind of oversee spending, they make sure that everything is on the up and up and we're not misappropriating funds. And then there are ongoing inspection and compliance checks, um, to Colonel Beach's point. Um, some of the uh, ongoing inspection checks, um, for example, there's a thing called an ASV. It's where the Air Force, actually AFCEC's office, comes down once a year. For example, last year our ASV score, I'm sorry, two years ago, our ASV score was actually an 85.5 and the acceptable level is an 80. So we were above average um, two years ago according to the annual site visit. So that's all for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Audra. Good evening again. Um, just wanted to take time to say thank you. I, I know that I said that before, but um, I'm really appreciative of having this follow-up town hall. There's a lot of work that we've done in the last six weeks, um, a lot of things to still come. I did want to briefly just go over kind of some best um, best practices that we have in action currently, and, and we're continuing to improve those processes and procedures going forward. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know, we, we did listen to um, what you had to say at the last town hall, and, and some of this is in result of that, and as well as partnering with our Air Force partner and HMO, and some of the comments that they've received on the surveys. So um, the first one is the PM program. So. Basically, we, you know, uh, historically we have never been 100% with PMs until the last two quarters, but really working with our team on training to ensure that, um, you know, they're, they're looking at the checklist. We revamped the checklist. Um, we've gone over, you know, if you're in the home and the resident mentions that there's something that needs to be fixed, making sure that work order gets submitted. I know that was kind of a common theme that was brought to our attention. So we have had continuous training on, on that process. Um, the RSS initiative, that's something that we've, we've had historically. We're just trying to revamp that again um, with kind of the, the resident touch, reaching out to you more, checking in, um, you know, birthday cards, and, and just making sure that you're, you, you know, when you move in, that you know where the grocery store is or where the vet is, and, and the little things that, you know, we don't think about until we get here. Um, so part of that RSS initiative is really just enhancing resident experience um, by giving you a one-stop shop. So, uh, of course, Lisa is over our duplex housing, Terry is over our circle housing, and um, Melody handles our, our key and essential member, service members. Work order scheduling, we kind of touched base on this a, a little bit last time, but we've added an additional step to that. So our warehouse supervisor, whenever she receives a work order, she reach out, reaches out and tries to schedule a time that coordinates with the service member or the spouse's schedule, um, just so that we can accommodate that. But also, we, we implemented something where if you submit a work order, whether it's on the phone or um, you put it through an email inquiry, we are giving you that work order um, number over the phone or via email. That way, if you want to call in and check on the status, hey, I'm just calling to check on the status of work order one, two, three, four, five, six. You have that work order, and then same thing when you receive the work order survey, you know you're receiving a work order survey for the work order number that was provided for that work order. Um, 
warm calls, 100% follow-up. So um, we're continuing to, to call all work orders that are completed or um, via email following up. And this, this will come from the RSR, RSS team. So again, Lisa and Duplex, Terry and Circle Homes, um, Melody with our key and essential members. Community engagement. So we really just, um, this has kind of been something that we've been working on over the last two years and, and something that we want to continue doing. So I know a, a lot of service members bring it to our attention that when they, they come and they move here, it, it, Randolph has a, a, a different atmosphere. Um, so we're trying to bring that community feeling back into the community with ho hosting events in neighborhoods. Um, I know last summer we, we held zone parties in the duplex area. Um, had water slides for the kids and watermelon and, and popsicles and, and things that bring um, you know all of us together. Um, we're going to continue do, doing that as well as monthly events. We, we do host monthly events. Um, but I think most importantly, community beautification. And, and that's my team getting out into the community, um, you know, repainting sheds. And I, I know most recently something was brought to my attention that was a really great idea of restamping where the bus stop is because those are faded. And that's something that we can do as well as mulching, um, you know, before somebody moves in, making sure that the, the landscaping is pruned and that it looks really good. Um, and same thing with, with Yard of the Month. Um, I, I mean, we've noticed a huge trend in, in people putting up flowers and, and really just beautifying their yards. And, and it's, it's awesome to see the community doing that because when I, when I got here two years ago, um, you know, that, that, was, that was a focus that, that we wanted to look at. Uh, we do provide a self-help area. I know um, a, a lot of people are unsure about where this is at. So it's in our maintenance shop, um, and Danelle is, is over that. She sits in the front office over there. Um, and just some basic items that we have is grass seed, HVAC filters, fluorescent light bulbs. Um, if you want toilet seats, tub stoppers, if you, if you need caulk, uh, weather stripping, th those are some of those things that um, if you just want to pop in and grab, Danelle is there um, and she will assist you with that. And uh, most importantly, partnership with the Air Force and, and with our HMO team, that, that has always been um, you know, consistent and, and one of our best practices. And, and most recently with the partnership um, with the BASH program and with pest control and, and entomology with rodents, um, and even with, with tree removal, so you know um, the, the Air Force is going in and helping with tree removal, but also our landscapers are going in and cutting shrubs back and, and assisting with the BASH program. So those are some things that we partner with. Um, and, and, and two of the most important things is staffing and organization. So we are actually going to be adding three full-time maintenance technicians um, to, to the team that we already have. Um, and then pest control. So I actually have my pest control team here tonight as well as landscaping. They're going to they're gonna speak a little bit. But we have decided to go ahead and add a technician, one of our maintenance technicians, to go with them whenever they're here on Tuesdays and Fridays. This helps simplify the process so that if there's anything that needs to be sealed or covered or taken care of, you guys don't have to worry about submitting another work order. That's something that we'll go ahead and take care of right then and there so that there's no follow-up and it, and it makes it a seamless process. Um, so, so that's a that's a really exciting initiative that that I like. But um, I'm going to hand it over to Michael Knight. He is going to talk to um, some of the the improvements we're looking at from and some of the things from the environmental walks we've had. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks everybody for being here. Wanted to take this opportunity to kind of give you guys a, an idea of what we've been working on. Um, we've we've completed several. Uh, environmental walks. Um, we, we've had we have two Nicks on our environmental team. Nick McGuire, who's here tonight, has completed about half of the walks. Uh, Nick Reed has also completed several of the walks to help identify some of the issues. So we wanted to take a look holistically at, at kind of what's going on. We know that Randolph has you know historic houses, historic construction, which uh, in, in today's society just leads to a lot of issues. Some of that the construction of, the, of these homes includes uninsulated exterior walls. They're not designed to be insulated. It's, they're plastered directly over block. They're single pane windows, um, crawl spaces that can create issues as well. And, and we needed to take a look at how we can address each one of those items to uh, help improve the overall quality of the, of the home, uh, meaning reduce uh, the humidity that's left inside the home uh, and create better ventilation as well. Um, as you guys all know, it's very green outside right now. Uh, San Antonio just came out of a, about a three-year drought. We've had an extremely wet winter. 
um, and that's kind of exacerbated the issues that already, already existed to, to some point due to the construction. Um, we've been through days where it's been all four seasons in one day recently. It's, it's very cold in the morning, it's, it's warm by the afternoon, and it's cold again at night. That um, plays havoc on these homes where you have large temperature swings on, uh, again, the single pane windows, uh, metal framed windows. That all leads to uh, those reaching dew point very quickly and, and creating condensation. So again, we needed to look at a, a solution for that. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've completed over 20 direct environmental walks based on concerns from the residents, um, as well as many others through um, vacant homes um, and bringing in some third parties to help us develop this plan. So what we've identified so far, we've actually started a pilot program um, that we're testing several of the ideas um, that we've developed and used at other sites to, and modified to fit San Antonio and the climate here. These were all developed um, by use of a third party. So these projects include whole home dehumidification systems. We know the building envelope has some issues and challenges in the construction, so we need to get the humidity out much faster. Um, We've already started several duct cleanings and we'll continue to do that. That will be a part of the pilot program um, to make sure that the, the HVAC system is up to speed. In doing that um, and installing the, the new uh, whole home dehumidifiers, the entire HVAC system gets a look over uh, by third party professional uh, to make sure that everything is running appropriately and as it should. Um, we are share, uh, planning to share this, this uh, project with Mr. Trevino and his team to make sure that, that they understand what we're doing and what we're trying to do to, uh, to get the humidity out of these homes. Uh, we've had a, uh, at least one meeting already to discuss and, and we'll continue to have that partnership um, back and forth. So a as we move forward, um, there is a larger focus on the overall project. It's, it's, we are looking at some individual things. We completed a, a pilot that was focused strictly on the master baths, um, and that was successful, but we identified the fact that there are other opportunities within the home, and that's why we've broadened this, this pilot program uh, to expand those. So we are actively doing um, this work. At this point, I'm gonna give it back to Audra, and she's gonna bring up, uh, I think, some of the vendors to talk about the other two areas, landscaping and pest control. Okay, so first we have uh, Michael Smoke. He is the um, landscaping supervisor here at, at Randolph Air Force Base with uh, Tidewater Landscaping. Thank you. Uh, I didn't know I was gonna be talking until about two days ago, so. Um, a little bit of information about Tidewater. Uh, it actually started in 1984 in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, we actually do six bases um, across the U.S. And uh, we have a, a very experienced team. Four of us have been here for three plus years on this base. And uh, one of us for one year. Um, I actually used to live on Randolph whenever I was a kid, so uh, I'm very familiar with the base. Um, as far as working with HMO, um, me and Audra do weekly drives to um, just basically have a preventative maintenance and you know she may, she may see something that uh, she would like to get cleaned up and, and we kind of focus on that the, uh, the next week. Um, I also uh, meet daily with the maintenance to see if there's any um, new emails or anything that uh, uh, residents have requested. Um, something If we get something on Monday or Tuesday we'll usually have it uh, knocked out by Friday. Um, as far as like if you have a fenced in backyard, we usually don't touch those, but you can request for us to go back there and maybe do some pruning or something because um, if you end up moving out, we're going to end up having to uh, clean it out anyway once the fence is removed. So it's actually better for us if we can get back there and do a little bit of maintenance on it. Um, as far as the mow schedule, uh, whenever we go through and do the mowing, we mow, we string trim, we edge, we blow. On Mondays, we do the 500, the 700 through 900 duplex area, and the 500 inner circle. Um, on Tuesdays, we do the 800 through 832 duplex area and the 600 inner circle. Wednesdays, we do the 800 through 600 duplexes and the 400 inner circle. On Thursday, that's the upper command day, and we do the front and backyards plus the 300 inner circle, and then Friday, we do the community center, 300 duplex, 400 duplexes, 
um, the medians behind the par clubs, and um, it's also kind of a catch-up day, so if there is something that has been requested during the week, we, if we don't get it knocked out while we're in that section, uh, we'll usually knock it out on, on Friday. Um, now, as far as the leaf mulching and pickup, uh, I'd like to thank the residents that do actually bag up their own leaves and leave it out on the curb for us. That actually helps us out a lot. Um, but we usually will blow out the front yards, the garden beds, into a common area and have our mowers kind of mulch up um, the leaves in that area. Um, and of course, uh, if you've been on the base this last year, you know that there's two falls. There's a, the first fall in October, November, and all the other trees, besides the oak trees, all the leaves will be shedding, and then the oak trees didn't shed till about maybe a month or two ago, and it's just been constant. So we still have pollen and stuff uh, coming down from the oak trees. And there's an oak tree probably every 10 feet on this base. Um, so we've been working with that. Unfortunately, we haven't had enough rain to, to get rid of the pollen, so we're still trying to keep the streets clean and, um, and get rid of some of these leaves. Uh, as far as the uh, pre and post emergent, um, pre emergence is basically laying down a pre emergence so the, le uh, the uh, weeds will not pop up. Um, post emergent is after weeds have popped up, it's just um, weed control on those. So the pre-emergent we, we do is, um, it's in our fertilizer. So when we lay down fertilizer, we're actually laying down a pre-emergent as well. And for the post-emergent, we use Cyclone 2.0. Um, it's pet friendly. And basically for that, we use it around um, garden beds, uh, around the back of the houses, around sheds, um, the playground areas. We'll use it in the playgrounds as well. Um, and so that's when we, we do that constantly through the year um, with the, with the post-emergent. Um, as far as the trim schedule goes, for the pruning the bushes around the houses, um, we used to do it where we'd go through a, a couple times a year and prune for you know, a week um, in one area and then go to the, to the next area for a week. And we're going to be implementing a new system of the way we do it. Basically, if uh, we're in your area on Monday, we're going to knock out six houses pruning, and then um, that way every three months, every, every house has, has got hit and that's in the area. So I think it would be a little bit easier that way. Um, we're, we're, every Monday we'll be in your section or every Tuesday or whichever section that you live in, uh, you'll be able to see us every week. So I think that will help out. Um, and then some general items. If you have trampolines or garden hoses, children's toys, um, stuff like that. If you want to pick those up, that would really help us out. Um, picnic tables, if you want to move them over after we've been there for that week and kind of just pick two different spots and move back and forth, then uh, that'll, that'll help us out. Um, cable wires, um, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, but we run over cable wires sometimes. And um, if you could let your cable company know to, to bury those as quickly as possible. They usually come out within a week, but sometimes we've seen cable wires on the ground for you know two months. So what I'll usually do is put a cone or something by it so my guys know um, that it's still there. Um, and then as far as the storms, um, if there's a storm, uh, we, we go through, first thing we do is go clean out all the storm drains. Um, so the, we're not getting pu uh, large puddles backed up into the street. Um, and then we'll go through once the storm is gone and pick up any down limbs. And that's usually what we do on Friday as well. If you have down limbs, um, you can put them by the curb or we'll, we're going to do a drive usually on Friday and we'll go pick up all, of the, all the down limbs. So, uh, and that's all I got. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next, I am going to introduce uh, Jose or Richard. Um, and they are with Worldwide Pest Control, so they're going to talk a little bit to the pest control. Thank you. All right, my name is Richard Young. I'm with Worldwide Pest Control. I'm one of the executives with the company. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to come out and speak a little bit about how we can work better together to get some of the pest control issues under control. Worldwide Pest Control started in 1985. We're a locally woman-owned business. Uh, we operate out of San Antonio, Austin, Corpus, and we've been here on base since 2004. So we've taken care of various parts of the facilities out here. Um, I have personally been out here for the past 
I guess nine years, so we are pretty familiar with the base. What we're wanting to do here is, I, I love the transparency in what we're hearing today and seeing. We want to make sure that if there are any issues, if there's something going on, that we can communicate and that gets relayed to us. Um, Audra and her team are doing very, very well about getting with us and what needs to be done. And we are getting the phone calls, so please understand that your voice is being heard. One thing that uh, we are going to start working on right now is, well, I tell you, let me back up. What happens when we come out on post? We come out, we head straight to the management office, and we find out what concerns are, have arrived from the past time that we're out. We service your facility every Tuesday and Friday, and we are here, you know, obviously, throughout the week. But if there are any special requests that come in, if there's an emergency, something that happens, uh, the office will give us a call, and we'll send a technician out. For emergency calls, uh, you know, we take those on a case by case, but depending on the time of the day, when we get somebody out, typically within a 24 hour period, they can be answered and taken care of. But just know that we are out here every Tuesday and Friday, and because of the size of the base, we have it spread out to where we are servicing the entire base every quarter. So during the time that we are out here, we divided it up to three different zones. Every month we are obviously taking care of that zone, but if there is something that is going on in your zone and it's not that time you know, of the quarter, let them know, we'll come out and we'll immediately address it so that you're not waiting for another two to three months. The technicians that come out here are certified applicators. Certified applicator is the highest position that you can receive or the highest license you can receive in the pest control industry. Uh, we do have an entomologist who is on staff who actually works for Worldwide Pest Control. It is not somebody that we have to call or you know, contract out to. They are actually an employee with us. So anytime we have an issue that our certified applicator cannot or is not knowledgeable in or has never seen the particular insect or bug or is a situation where two heads are better than one, we give them a call and we're able to come out and address that issue immediately. What you have going on on base, we have two certified applicators who come out to service the facility on a monthly basis during those times on a Tuesday and Friday when we come out. We're also having two additional technicians who are coming out who are specifically trained to handle the environments that we're dealing with out here. Uh, obviously, it's a big base. We have a lot of oak trees, as we explained. We have a lot of water. There's a lot of other, uh, I guess, incidents going on and particular situations out here on the base that are a little different than what we may find in other commercial properties or residential properties. With the age of the home and the homes that we have out here, we're needing to put a bigger barrier. We're needing to do a little more work, and we are addressing that as, as best and fast as possible right now. So one thing that we are also working on is on base right now, the, the rodents was something that was brought up. Right now we have over 500 rodent stations on base. Since these stations have been brought out, the calls for rodents and the activity in the stations has gone way down. I believe we've only had two exclusions done since we were out. I mean, that, that's, that's huge. Uh, an exclusion that's brought up is whenever there's an issue and somebody has a rodent that has gotten into the building or into their home, we come out, we take a look at the, at the environment, so we take a look at the outside of the building or the home, we try to find out where the opening is at so that we can seal it up from the outside, therefore preventing it from getting in. But also, that lets us know that, okay, if we have an issue in house one, two, three, four, that means we need to take a look at the house across the street, next to and behind, so that we can find out if there's any water that's standing, if there's any vegetation that's there that they're, they're eating on, if there's a harboring area. There's more that goes into it than just, okay, we're gonna go seal up a hole. And with the new 
process that's been implemented, uh, there's an actual maintenance uh, technician going with us as well to clear those matters up ASAP. So as we're out and as the calls come in, when we go out, know that it's gonna be addressed even quicker now so that this can be looked at and we take a proactive approach to it instead of a reactive. Uh, the, the other process that we're gonna implement is each station is gonna have a barcode in it, which means the technician is going to open it up, the barcode would be on the inside. They're gonna scan that particular rodent station and there's different levels of activity that we can read from the rodenticide blocks that are inside. So if it has minimal activity, a little more than that, or, or a lot of activity, we're able to scan a particular bar and that's gonna let us know, okay, in this particular area, we've noticed an increase of activity in the past month or two months and we need to figure out why we're having a push. You know, is it the weather? Is, you know, there's multiple uh, variables that can add to that. So the good thing about the, the barcoding system is the management office will also get a copy of this so that they can help keep monitor it as well. You know, it's, it's a win-win for everybody in taking a proactive approach so that we can help prevent that from happening anymore. So the other thing that we're doing is whenever we have an issue come up, you know, a fire ant mound, uh, ants in the yard, it, there are different ways we can attack it. There are quarterly power sprays that are now going to be happening. So not only are we going to be doing our regular service, but there's going to be a power spray that's going to be going on in each individual area on a quarterly basis. So we're stepping up that program to help build a bigger barrier from the home to the street. Uh, we use liquid during that power spray, but during the times in between the quarterly services where we power spray, we're gonna use a granule. So the granule is a little heavier. It gets down into the ground a little more and with the humidity and with some of the water that we have, it helps activate it. It's going to, to build a longer barrier as well. So rest assured, the management company is aware of what's going on and we are taking these proactive uh, treatments now or proactive measures to help ensure that we get a jump on it before the summertime hits. Let's see here. Okay, so on the, the, on the topic of when we go and do an inspection, if your technician is walking around the property in the home, they're keeping in mind and they also have in their notes a um, integrated pest management uh, report that they do. So it's a pest control operators report. What they're doing is they will pull up your address write something down if there are, let's say there's a termite, okay, the termite tube, or they see something that doesn't quite look right, they will address it, they will make sure they make the notes, they get with the management office, they get a copy of the email, and so do we. So we'll be able to address any issues on a proactive level a lot quicker now. And that's something that we are striving to get taken care of a lot quicker for everyone. The other is the, the other I guess, added personnel that we're gonna we're gonna add more people to our roster. So we are going to be coming out here quite a bit more. We're gonna add another four to six people technicians coming out on a monthly basis, not only to help start taking a more proactive role in the rodent stations, but also being a visual aid, going around as they're walking the properties, checking the stations. They're gonna let us know if they see something that needs to be addressed. If there's an ant mound, there's ants, if uh, there, there's other insects or bugs that are around that need to be treated, they're gonna let us know and, and or they have the product on the truck, they'll go ahead and take care of it right then and there. So there's gonna be a lot bigger presence uh, of worldwide technicians on property. I encourage everyone to please let the management office know if you do have any issues going on. Please understand we are working as hard as we can to, and as quickly as possible, to address any concerns that you may have. We are also 
working with the weather, which is very difficult here in, in South Texas. So it, we understand communication is key. We're gonna do everything we possibly can, but um, understand that when we treat, give it a few days to, to, to take effect. On most products can be an immediate um, visual where you won't see anything, but for the most part, two to three days after a technician has come out to spray, you will see the full effect of the product. So after that point, if there are any other issues still happening, let the management company know and they will get a hold of us right away. And I appreciate your time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, next I'd uh, like to introduce again Nicholas Miglieri. He's our environmental director. He's gonna go over a couple of things. Thank you, Audra. Thank you all for being here. Um, I will go fairly quickly because I know my time is limited, um, but we will obviously be here for questions afterwards if you want to um, ask more questions or discuss any specifics with me. Um, so I want to throw a slide in here first about analytical mold testing. It's a common request that um, we have been getting across the portfolio. Um, so I just want to start off by saying that we follow the published guidelines of the EPA, the CDC, um, and over 40 state agencies that recommend against mold air testing um, in homes. So um, we actually did a study of all 50 states. Um, over 40 of them actually have guidance on their public health department uh, sites um, that say that uh, mold air testing is not a viable form of analysis for determining if there's a mold problem inside a home. Um, other agencies or other states that um, don't actually come outward and say that they recommend against it, um, don't recommend it. So I guess most notably what I'm trying to say is no state in um, the United States recommends mold air testing. Um, Part of the reason for this is there's no safe or regulatory limit of mold spores in uh, indoor air. So, um, you know, for example, um, talking more in the occupational field now, if we look at something like silica dust, um, there's been research done and there's actually a, an established limit for silica dust um, that a person can be exposed to. So um, that doesn't exist for mold. So part of the reason is every person is a little bit different. Um, we all have different sensitivities. So, um, and the research is still, still happening, but there's no you know, regulatory limit of mold spores, so there's really no way that we can look at um, mold testing results and say that a building is compliant or non-compliant against any established standards. Um, the CDC, EPA, and OSHA, uh, and other agencies also have not found any link between any specific level of mold and illness. Um, so kind of a, a funny example, if you, know, if you drink some beers, um, the more beer you drink, the more you're going to feel it, right? Um, that does not exist with mold as far as it hasn't been established. So um, there's not a specific level that's necessarily going to trigger any type of response from a person. Uh, and then finally, air testing is a high degree of variability due to the low amount of air sampled. So most um, air sampling is going to be non-viable form. The aerosol uh, sampling is commonly done. That's only sampling like 150 liters of air. So 150 liters of air is not much. Um, and the fact that conditions can change from day to day or even hour to hour. So those air sample results are largely dependent on outdoor conditions. Um, if there was a day that maybe we had high mold counts outside, um, the results could look more favorable. And if we had a day that maybe there was lower, mold, lower outdoor mold count, um, then the results maybe would look less favorable. It doesn't mean that the condition of the home changed at all, it just means that the ambient conditions in the air changed. So this stuff is changing very quickly. Um, I'll go through our lead-based paint protocols here quickly. Uh, first of all, all of our residents are notified at lease inception pursuant to procedures set forth in federal law, so that is Title 10, um, the, the federal lead-based paint disclosure rule, so that basically says any home that is Built before 1978, um, if it doesn't, if it hasn't been previously abated, um, does have the potential for lead-based paint presence in it. So we do have some survey data available to us, um, so we have an idea of of where most of the lead-based paint is. But um, we do, obviously, since all the homes are historic, um, operate with extreme caution when we're dealing with this kind of stuff. Residents and employees both share responsibility for recognizing and reporting damaged and deteriorating lead paint. So. Um, you know, we're, we're not always going to know that there's maybe an issue um, in your home, so it's important for you to report that stuff to us. Um, common friction points like doors and windows um, would be a good example of that. All lead-based paint service requests are prioritized in our work order system as an emergency, so that means that if you 
do call in a service request related to lead-based paint, we will respond um, within, Mike, it's an hour, right? <laughs> we will respond in an hour. Um, EPA's renovation, repair, and painting rule, or the RRP rule, dictates that affected areas less than six square feet uh, on the interior per room and less than 20, 20 square feet on the exterior of a structure can be handled by trained in-house maintenance personnel. So those are our cutoffs. If we have an area um, where we're gonna disturb greater than six square feet per interior room of lead-based paint or greater than 20 square feet on the exterior, we would use a certified lead-safe firm. Um, so they're certified through the federal EPA. They have to go through a training course and then they have to be um, basically vetted by the EPA and get that certificate. So if they don't have that certificate and this work needs to be done, we will not use them. Common remediation methods for damaged lead-based paint include HEPA vacuuming, wet wiping, or mopping of hard surfaces and flooring near the affected areas. So um, go, kind of going back to that, that third bullet point, um, I guess second bullet point. Those friction surfaces, you know, we might need to pay a little bit of extra attention to those um, as far as house cleaning goes. So if you notice any, any chipping or flaking paint, um, you might just need to hit it with a mop or a, a wet rag. Um, finally, the, the last slide I have here is just in relation to employee training and vendor compliance. So all HMC employees are going to receive initial new hire environmental training. Um, they also go through our quarterly safety and environmental training. And then there's also going to be an annual in-person environmental awareness training. And that's going to be completed by either myself or someone that works on my team. Or sometimes we're going to use a designated uh, third party to do that training. And that's more based on, on geographics than anything else. Um, any vendor that we utilize is going to, to perform any mold, asbestos, or lead-based paint work is going to be vetted by the corporate maintenance, uh, safety, and environmental team. So that's my team. That's Mike's team. So we're, we're going we're gonna to vet these contractors ourselves, do some research on them, make sure that they do have the proper certifications and experience that we need. And then they also undergo a third-party vetting that ensures current licenses, insurance, bonding, and any other applicable specialty certification. So it's kind of a two-step vetting process that we use, and that, that's for all of our vendors. So that's all I have. Thank you, Nick. And, and that concludes our informational portion of this. So I think I'm going to turn it back over to General Linderman.